Any literate person can confirm that the first chapter of the Bible plainly describes how God spoke the universe into existence in six consecutive numbered days, complete with evenings and mornings. And they would agree that the second chapter describes how God then rested on the seventh day and declared it holy. Plus, the astute observer would recognize that the second chapter more specifically details the same six days of creation with a focus on mankind rather than the overall chronology. Then, even the simplest of readers could comprehend that in the third chapter of the Bible it's written that a very crafty serpent tempted Eve, the first woman, and the mother of all human beings, and convinced her to eat the fruit of the one forbidden tree God commanded they never consume. And this is how death entered the world through the sin of the first man and woman. Also, no one could miss how in the sixth through the ninth chapters of the Bible, a global flood is described as a divine judgment on rampant corruption, universal wickedness, and widespread sin but a remnant of mankind and the animals were preserved because a faithful and genetically pure man named Noah built an ark for his small family and those animals in obedience to God. You see, no one can honestly deny that the first nine chapters of the Bible clearly describe the creation of the universe in six days by nothing more than God speaking, a talking serpent, who plunged humanity into entropy, decay, and death by tempting a woman to eat a forbidden fruit and a worldwide deluge that wiped out all air-breathing life from the earth that was not safely on the ark with Noah's family of eight. But even though these messages are plainly written and people have universally read them the same way for over 3,500 years, since the so-called Enlightenment of the 18th century, Many scholars and theologians have fought against the plain reading of those passages and treated them like myths, legends, fairy tales, or fables. In fact, in 2010, Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis commissioned America's research group to survey 200 Christian colleges and universities across America, and the results were nothing short of sickening. According to the book Already Compromised, eight years ago, only 58% of the 200 surveyed leaders of Christian colleges and universities believed that the flood was worldwide, even though that's clearly what the Bible describes. And only 60% believed that God created the earth in six literal days. Plus, belief in a literal Adam and Eve was eroding quickly, too. For example, almost 15,000 leaders of the Christian Church in America have publicly written, within the community of Christian believers there are areas of dispute and disagreement, including the proper way to interpret Holy Scripture. While virtually all Christians take the Bible seriously and hold it to be authoritative in matters of faith and practice, the overwhelming majority do not read the Bible literally as they would a science textbook. Many of the beloved stories found in the Bible, the creation, Adam and Eve, Noah and the ark, convey timeless truths about God, human beings, and the proper relationship between creator and creation expressed in the only form capable of transmitting these truths from generation to generation and proving that they consider creation, Adam and Eve, and Noah's flood only to be mere stories, their letter goes on to say, we believe that the theory of evolution is a foundational scientific truth, one that has stood up to rigorous scrutiny, and upon which much of human knowledge and achievement rests. To reject this truth, or to treat it as one theory among others, is to deliberately embrace scientific ignorance and transmit such ignorance to our children. Their thinking is also reflective of the words of John Snyder, who taught theology at Calvin College in Michigan 
until voluntarily retiring in 2011. And in an interview with National Public Radio, Professor Snyder, who, I repeat, used to teach theology at a respected Christian institution that claims to offer a courageous and comprehensive Christ-centered education, said, It's time to face facts. There was no historical Adam and Eve, no serpent, no apple, no fall that toppled man from a state of innocence. And because the so-called Christian education system in America is abandoning God's word, Americans are rapidly following their example. In May of 2017, Gallup reported that it found that only 24% of Americans still believe that the Bible is the literal word of God. And in 2011, NPR reported that Gallup and the Pew Research Center have found that only 4 in 10 Americans actually believe the Bible's account of Adam and Eve. Truly, having spoken with many highly educated theologians and PhD credentialed Christians, I can tell you that the modern post-enlightenment education system will eventually be the demise of mainstream biblical Christianity. And this is because the education system relies heavily on tradition and the approval of men, and the church at large generally relies on that same education system to qualify every candidate for church leadership. You see, those who hold to a literal, straightforward reading of Scripture that actually believes all that God has said are now considered to be uneducated, unscientific simpletons. And the educated, sophisticated Scripture twisters like Professor Snyder are held up as the standard of academic greatness. But Jesus would ask these compromised Christian leaders, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? And the Messiah would say to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Brothers and sisters, we must be very careful to avoid the trap of respecting the same things the world around us respects, because most of the time their highly respected things are detestable in the eyes of our God. For example, the world around us highly respects the theory of evolution, and that theory in the vast ages of time they theorize evolution requires is one of the main reasons Christian theologians are abandoning the literal reading of the Bible. And by doing this, they fulfill Paul's words in Romans when he explained, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Now this passage may have originally applied to pagan idolatry, but it can also easily be adapted to the equally idolatrous concept that man can now deduce more accurately how life began than God could describe it in the Holy Scriptures. And since the evolutionist imagines birds and four-footed animals and creeping things being our direct ancestors, instead of us being directly created by God as described in Genesis chapter 2, Paul's words seem very applicable to their foolishness. But Peter prophesied that people would one day resist the first nine chapters of Genesis just as they often oppose the plain reading of Bible prophecy. He wrote, Scoffers! will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth, standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Now, did you notice that Peter said the world 
that then existed perished being flooded with water? Let me ask you, do you think that the Apostle Peter thought the flood was worldwide or local after reading the passage he wrote? Peter must have noticed that the Bible specifically mentioned all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Also, doesn't it seem like Jesus indicated that he believed in a literal flood when he said, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be? For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Didn't Luke sufficiently demonstrate that he believed in a literal Adam and a literal Noah when he ended the Lord's human genealogy by saying that Jesus was ultimately the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God? Please notice Adam was not the son of an ape-like ancestor. Scripture says he was the son of God. And Scripture also says that Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So the Bible is clear that every human being descended from Adam and Eve, and they were directly created by God on day six of creation. I also ask you to consider that Luke's genealogy starts at what the Bible describes as the very beginning and takes us all the way to the birth of the Savior. And any modern historian can tell you that Jesus was born approximately 2,000 years ago. So simply by looking at Luke's genealogy, you can estimate the age of the earth using available ages the Bible supplies regarding when each person on this list had their listed son, or estimating that they were a very conservative 70 years old when their son was born in the unknown cases. And you'll arrive at a number below 9,000 years using very conservative estimates. Therefore, the Bible doesn't leave us any honest intellectual room for believing the theory of Darwinian evolution or vast ages of the earth. In fact, the secular evolutionary narrative and the Bible's account of human history are diametrically opposed. And that's not my reading of Scripture, that's Scripture's reading of itself. The Bible doesn't leave room for mankind getting better and better when it describes that Adam lived for 930 years, Lamech lived for 777 years, and Noah lived for 950 years. But Abraham only lived for 175 years, and Moses only lived for 120 years. Obviously, the Bible describes a decline in the longevity of the human race, not an increase. And Jesus didn't leave room for billions of years for Adam and Eve to evolve when he said, From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Clearly Jesus believed that Adam and Eve, who that passage he quoted was written about, were created at the beginning, not millions or billions of years after the beginning. And Peter believed that the ancient world was destroyed, not just a large plain in Mesopotamia, because he wrote, God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, when he brought a flood upon the ungodly world. Also, the writer of Hebrews shared Peter's belief that the flood was worldwide because he wrote, By faith Noah, having been warned by God concerning the things not yet seen, being reverent, 
prepared an ark for the salvation of his household through which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And I should also mention that Paul obviously believed Genesis 1-3 where it is recorded God said, let there be light and there was light. Because Paul wrote, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Paul also believed the literal reading of Genesis 2, 21 through 24, where it is written, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The apostle who gave us the majority of the post-Messianic books of the Bible later wrote, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. And Adam was formed first, then Eve. Also, Paul believed that the literal first man named Adam was literally formed from the dust because he wrote, It is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And Jude plainly believed the genealogies of the Bible, because he wrote, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. Plus, Paul clearly believed in a literal fall of mankind, because he taught, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And he also believed in a literal serpent in the garden, because he confessed, I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Thus, the Apostle John also believed in a literal serpent who relies on deception as a weapon because he wrote in Revelation, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So you see, when so-called Christian professors and church leaders say things like, it's time to face facts, there was no historical Adam and Eve, no serpent, no apple, no fall that toppled man from a state of innocence, we must realize that they're not just contradicting the first nine chapters of the Holy Bible. They're contradicting Jesus and his holy apostles who gave us the rest of the Bible too. And about such people, Scripture warns, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. And if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, 
He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourselves. But I should also warn you, long before they contradict the idea of a literal Adam, a literal serpent, or a literal fall, they will contradict the idea of six literal days of creation. They will tell you that there are gaps between verses 1 and 2. And they'll tell you that each day is a long period of time. Or they'll twist the plain reading in some other way. But the simple idea that God made all there is in our world in six literal days seems to terrify, embarrass, or confound the modern academic more than any other message the Bible clearly conveys. And now that we've seen how Jesus and his apostles commented on the proper reading of Genesis, I'd like to point out, if the first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus said God made Adam and Eve in the beginning, that eliminates gaps in long ages between the first verse and the sixth day. Plus, those who mistakenly contradict the first chapter of Genesis and claim God did not create the heavens, the earth, and everything else in six days and rest on the seventh day are also contradicting the very words of God written by his own finger in stone. Because commandment number four of the Ten Commandments clearly states, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The tablets that were considered so holy that they were carried in the Ark of the Covenant that resided in the Holy of Holies where God met with Moses boldly declare that God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in the heavens, the earth, and the sea in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, just as Genesis declares. And to disagree with Genesis, one must contradict the very words of Yahweh himself, who also said, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Is Yahweh bearing false witness? Is he mistaken about how long it took him to make the heavens, the earth, 
and every other thing described in Genesis chapters 1 and 2? Is he demanding that people be put to death based on a mythological creation account? Do we trust God, who was there, who knows all things, who cannot lie, and who never makes mistakes? Or do we trust man, who was not there, who is easily deceived, and who commonly makes mistakes? Properly identifying fact and fiction is one of the most important jobs you and I have in this present life. The Bible teaches us over and over again that Eve improperly confused fiction with fact and led her husband to do the same and death, pain, and suffering enter the world through their sin. But the unholy professors of America's compromised Christian colleges and the confused pastors they are producing from their corrupted institutions would have you believe that death, sin, pain, and suffering pre-existed Adam and Eve and the process of Darwinian evolution that relies on death is responsible for life as we know it today. Friends, this thinking undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Bible's explanation for the origin of evil. And I have shown you very plainly that God, Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, Jude, Luke, and every other servant of God quoted in the Bible would vehemently disagree with the pattern of thinking known as theistic evolution. So now, please let me show you briefly how even real science actually refutes the myth of Darwinian evolution. Have you ever had a doctor ask you about diseases or conditions in your family history? Did they ask you if your mother, father, grandfather, or grandmother had diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, or other issues? Well, the reason they're asking is because of the science of genetics. Sadly, every child inherits some of the genetic mistakes that their parents carried. They pass on those genetic mistakes to their children, and they pass on those mistakes to their children. And as our cells reproduce in our own bodies, they sometimes make mistakes, and sometimes we pass down those mistakes to our children and grandchildren too. This is why the Human Genome Research Institute has said, as we unlock the secrets of the human genome, the complete set of human genes, we are learning that nearly all diseases have a genetic component. Some diseases are caused by mutations that are inherited from the parents and are present in an individual at birth, like sickle cell disease. Other diseases are caused by acquired mutations in a gene or a group of genes that occur during a person's life. Such mutations are not inherited from a parent, but occur either randomly or due to some environmental exposure. And this accumulation of mutated genes that cause disease is getting worse all the time, according to Cornell University geneticist Dr. John Sanford. He has devoted more than 10 years of his life to the study of this specific problem, and he has concluded that the genomes of all living creatures are degenerating due to the accumulation of slightly harmful mutations. Therefore, all biological life forms are actually devolving instead of evolving, and Dr. Sanford calls this observable process genetic entropy. You see, everything in the universe is winding down. Hot things get colder, organized things get disorganized, and our genetic code is getting less organized each time we reproduce. And this means that reality is operating in the exact opposite direction that evolution requires. Also, the genetic code that's present in all biological life forms is a complicated programming language complete with detailed instructions for how an organism will develop, live, and reproduce. But such an instructional language for complex programming must necessarily proceed from a mind. I say this because language is a recognizable 
organization of matter or sound that has the ability to communicate information. For example, in written language, we organize ink on paper or letters on a refrigerator in a very specific order to convey a message to someone else. And in spoken language, we organize sound waves with our mouths in a very specific order to convey a message to someone too. But please try to imagine finding or hearing any form of highly organized, meaningful communication, and then try to picture that language coming from anything but a mind. Even a tape recorder requires a mind to assemble it, and whatever message it records must first be produced by an intelligent source. So when you really think about it, language must originally proceed from a mind, especially when it is a complex programming language and the fundamental information contained in the complex language of DNA requires an intelligent source. Therefore, time and chance could never account for its order and complexity. About these facts, former geophysicist and college professor Stephen C. Meyer, who received his PhD in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge, said, The DNA molecule is literally encoding information into alphabetic or digital form. And that's a hugely significant discovery because what we know from experience is that information always comes from an intelligence. Whether we're talking about hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or a headline in a newspaper, if we trace information back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. So the discovery that DNA codes information in a digital form points decisively back to a prior intelligence. So we have proven that DNA is a complex language and it must have originated from an intelligent source, not random chance. And we've established that entropy is negatively affecting DNA, and all biological life forms are degrading over time, not improving. So please believe me when I say it does not matter how many people call the fiction of evolution a fact. What matters is what the Word of God says. And despite the ever-increasing attempts to twist the Word of God to fit with the fiction of evolution, the Bible plainly teaches the facts of a six-day creation, the whole human race descending from Adam and Eve, a fall through disobedience, and a global flood in the days of Noah.